Thanks so much. Now, uh, yeah, Dave Curlio is going to join us here in a second, deploying cloud infrastructure with F Sharp. Let me see if I can get David. Hey, Dave. Hello. Hi, everyone. There we go. Good to see you. Thanks so much for joining us as part of .NET Conf. Absolutely. I'm excited to be here. So, so deploying cloud infrastructure, I'm used to just pushing, pushing the, the button to download a profile from the Azure portal, or I'm in a GitHub action, and I say, yeah, go ahead and send it to Azure. I can do this with F Sharp? Yes, absolutely. You can do all that with F Sharp. So, um, I, you know, I mean, deploying to the cloud um, sometimes can be a little bit tricky. Um, you know, the, the portal helps out a lot. Um, it, you know, it makes a lot of good choices for you. Um, but if you look at some of the more complex resources, there's certainly a lot of options to them. And, um, and so F Sharp, you know, representing some of those things in F Sharp enables us to kind of define a lot of those complex deployments in a, in a more manageable way. And then we can kind of push the code straight from F Sharp up to uh, Azure. Oh, that's cool. Well, gosh, I'm sure you've got some slides and stuff to share with us. So I'll get your screen up on on the, the video here for us. All right. There you go. And uh, the stage is yours. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, again, my name is Dave Curlo. Um, I'm going to go over deploying some cloud infrastructure with F Sharp. Um, just about me real quick. So I'm, I'm part of Microsoft Atlanta. Um, I reside in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm an engineer on the Azure dedicated team. Um, we do do uh, lots of uh, F Sharp use F Sharp and, and some of our stack um, I have expertise is kind of what I've done is uh, infrastructure and distributed systems work. Um, I'm also a member of the F Sharp um, Software Foundation Board of Trustees. Um, been on it for a couple of years. I've been with the foundation um, um, for quite a while. Um, I encourage people if they haven't joined to join. It's free um, and you can, you can connect with a lot of other F Sharp engineers there. Um, you can find me on Twitter um, and, and GitHub as well. Um, so infrastructure deployment uh, development. So, so infrastructure development is um, a little bit different than you might say database development or front end development. So it's software to deploy and manage, you know, physical and virtual hardware. And you're doing that usually so others can build on like a solid platform. And one thing about it, you know, infrastructure developers are always saying where it's like idempotent and infrastructure as a service. And we'll talk about goal states. Um, and one thing I want to say, like when you're an infrastructure developer, your resources are constrained by, you know, they're constrained by money because you've got to buy physical equipment a lot of times um, and time like the stuff. Infrastructure testing is slow. Some of the stuff takes, you know, 15 minutes. It's not like a unit test or an integration test. You know, when you're testing infrastructure, you've got to You can it can take hours to get through um, some of the tests. Um, you're limited by physical space. I mean, you got, you've got data centers with racks of servers and you can only put so many racks <laughs> in. And, and uh, so, you, you know, you can imagine large development teams um, do get constrained by physical space and hardware limits. But probably one of the biggest things, and this is where F Sharp comes into play, is that system failure is kind of an expectation. So it's one of those things that, that happens when, especially you're dealing with hardware, you're dealing with networks, you're dealing with DNS and authentication, all these things kind of come into play. Um, so we have to be cognizant of the of the different failure modes. So when you're running applications on the cloud, you've got cloud native applications are built with dependencies on cloud infrastructure. It's usually you might be dependent on Key Vault or storage accounts or, you know, if you and this is whether it's, you know, Azure, AWS, and whoever you're using, you're 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 used building a cloud native application, you're depending on it, might be depending on it for hosting your service, for hosting your DNS, for hosting some of your storage. Um, but you get the benefits of scale. So like a tiny company is able to use the same resources and processes like a huge enterprise, which is one of the things I really like about it because it enables anybody to run their code. And it's not like you, you've always heard that, I'm, you know, a cloud is just a VM under somebody else or a machine under somebody else's desk. And it's a little bit more than that because you're getting all these, you know, all these people who specialize in running that hardware and there's people that that um, have gone through all these compliance processes and there's all these security policies. And as a tiny company, you can use the same thing as a big company. So I think that's kind of cool. Um, of course, it gets baked into the price, but like that, that's that's one of the things that you take advantage of. Um, you can scale up really well. Um, and so instead of a local library like you would in a, in a traditional application, you would probably use functionality from a remote system. And this leads to a lot of different sorts of failure modes. So when you write code for an application, you usually write it pretty optimistically. You'll fail fast, log errors, recover, move on. You know, if you're writing against a database, transaction fails, you may just log it and not worry about it, or you may restart. 
in infrastructure, it's a little different. Failure modes can actually cascade, like a failure in authentication or DNS or whatever can cause a call to one component to fail or another sus subsystem to fail, leading to another failure or another failure, you know, with really big failures. Um, and they're distributed systems. And unlike a database, like the rollback and retry are pretty questionable. Um, you can't always roll back um, all the, across all the different systems. You can't always retry. So one of the big important things is to be able to represent failure um, in the type system. This is what we kind of heavily try and use. So it, it, if we can represent failure, and this is one of the features of F Sharp that I really, really like, is that you have the result type that you can manage, or you can represent the fact that optimistically it might succeed, result okay, um, but pessimistically it, it could fail. Um, and, and, and then you're representing it to the compiler, and then, then the compiler will force you to deal with the fact that it might fail. And so you can imagine your, that kind of cascades through your code. So the cascading failures that you might have had in your software, you can now have represented to your compiler. And it's not going to be pointed out in code reviews by subjective engineers, but like the compiler, which is a pretty objective thing, will say, hey, uh, you didn't handle this error. What's up? Um, and you can do this with exceptions, of course, like, but errors are different from exceptions. So, you know, results, a result.error is represented in the signature of a call, whereas an exception is not really in the signature. I mean, you, you can look at a, a function and not know that it throws an exception. Um, the compiler, on the other hand, will check that you handle errors. Like it will say, you have to handle this structure. Whereas exceptions, you have a you might have a person who knows the internals of that call and knows that you have to have to check the error, check the check for those exceptions um, and handle them. <clears throat> but so with errors, developers are forced to basically proactively consider failure modes. Whereas error exceptions, they might be found during testing or deployment. You've probably all been through this, where you you get a null reference exception or something that you just dig it up in the middle in the middle of your um. It's basically unexpected plan, uh, unplanned time to kind of deal with an exception. So if you can proactively think about failure when you're doing your, your development, you're doing it on a Tuesday at three in the afternoon or something like that. You find an exception, it will be in a lab environment or a customer system, and it could be in the middle of the night on a, on a Saturday. And I'd much rather be able to get them up front. And then F Sharp, the compiler's pretty strict about these things and you end up having to deal with a lot of errors, you get to deal with them on your own time instead of um, other times. So, all right, so about Azure. So um, we have orchestration and failure mode. So with Azure, when you wanna de deploy a cloud native application, you have to orchestrate multiple service and calls to re reach what we call a goal state. So the goal being these resources are deployed. Um, any of these service calls may fail for unexpected reasons. Um, and, and inside Azure, it, we we um, we like to represent errors as a terminal state versus a transient failure. So like a terminal error is one that you can't retry. It's just the system's busted. You're gonna have to go roll back. You're gonna have to do something else. Or transient one where you okay retry it and it'll work. Um, and so you if you have an orchestrator that's aware of that fact, then it can kind of handle some of that for you. So ARM deployments are one that orchestrate a series of goal states. So we've got all these resources. We want to get them into this state. If they give you some transient errors, like, oh, this DNS lookup failed, or this, this web service was briefly down, um, ARM will go, oh, uh, that's, a, that's a transient one, I'll just retry it. And then it'll just work um, kind of blindly to you. You don't have to worry about it. Another thing about ARM deployments is that they execute in the cloud. So they're, they're not executing locally um, on your system. Like if you, you know, run an Azure CLI or something like that, it's executing locally on the system. The ARM deployments run in the cloud so when they're pulling credentials down, it's all internal to Azure. Um, it's also integrated with Azure authentication, auditing, there's telemetry, there's correlations kind of automatically baked in. So if you have a problem with something, you can actually say, here's my correlation ID for my deployment, and they can look at all the different services that you're talking to. So it's, it's pretty neat. Um, it's orchestration that you don't have to write or execute. So you don't have to think about all those different failure modes, which is nice challenges of them. So the syntax is very verbose. There's you know, either in JSON or BICEP, and this is the same on AWS. So there's ARM deployments, there's cloud formation. Either case, they're very very verbose. You have to define all of your dependencies and being in these big big um, files, your composition is pretty limited. And as f -sharp developer, you probably like to compose lots of things together, um, but you, you it's kind of hard to do that when they're on a bunch of loose files. Um, 
And all these things, the, the ARM template just represents the goal states and the dependencies between them. Any logic you might want kind of has to be done externally and you don't really have an ecosystem. So this leads to generally leads to a lot of templates and a lot of parameters to manage. And it's an external file in JSON. There's not really any type checking. So all those things that you have in F Sharp developer, you lose. Um, so Farmer is kind of cool. It helps you out with this in a way. It, it generates standard ARM templates. Um, and this is a tool that we, we, we use some in Azure. I've used it for quite a while. I've contributed to it as well. Um, and, and we use it. And if you watch the SafeStack talk uh, a little earlier, that, that one, part of the safe template uses Farmer for the Azure deployments. Um, but your templates are authors of F-sharp code. So it gives you full type checking around your orchestration definition and your resources. There are all these builders for each type of resource um, and you can compose those together. So you could define the way you want a VM to look like, and it's just a little expression in an F-sharp file. You can use it in other ones, or you can parameterize them with regular F-sharp code um, and get, generate lots of different um, types of resources. Um, a builder can add one or more resources to templates. So like a VM has network cards and storage accounts, sometimes has, um, you know, has it has the uh, VM disks. So it has all these pieces that go with it. And you'll just define a VM and, and then some options, and then you'll get all those pieces. Um, the dependencies are automatically kind of chained together. Um, you get a regular ARM template out of Farmer, um, but you don't have to actually go in and, and hard code all the JSON for it. Um, the cool thing is F Sharp is cross platform. You can use it anywhere. I think with .NET Core, they've even started to support it on Windows. So F Sharp is not just a Linux and Mac OS tool anymore. Um, it's nice. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go into a quick code sample and I'm going to kind of demonstrate it. But this is what some some of the Farmer DSL basically looks like. So here we've got a container group. If you're familiar with Azure, um, Azure's got these container groups that are kind of a, a lightweight way to deploy a container. So you've got some software you just want to package it in a, in a container and deploy it onto Azure, and and you can you can do that pretty quickly. Um, and here, it, it, hopefully, this is relatively clear. So we've got we've got a name of our container group. We farmer containers. We get them in a DNS entry for public DNS. Um, call it, and it's running on port eighty. We've had some. We added, we added an instance of a container. You can add many containers to a container group. Here, we're adding one for. Um, the uh, Xplot service. So I'm gonna. Uh, Philip was just showing this. I'm gonna. I'm gonna use this in my demo as well. But uh, and then we're gonna kind of run a little service that shows Xplot. And and here we're re referencing registry credentials. So you can reference, you know, a uh, 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 ACRs, uh, Azure Container Registry. Um, so and it kind of plums all this together and ends up generating a template that just works. Um, and as you need to go, the the big thing is like your orchestration only becomes more complex over time. And as it does, you need to refactor things. And this would allow you to be able to refactor. An F sharp compiler goes, hey, you're missing this thing. Oh, you need to change this thing. Uh, and, and that way, you're able to see where your changes over time um, can be, would be applied. Um, one other thing I want to talk about with, with it is that, so I, I get to work with Eugene Tomashev. He's, uh, he's another developer on, on our team. And uh, he made a really good quote. Um, Contributing is what the F Sharp community does best. So F Sharp is built on community engagement. It's, it's, it's been a long time open source model. Um, and a lot of influence comes from you know, JavaScript, Haskell, Scala, Python, people who've worked in other ecosystems. And, and so they, they've seen great solutions and be able to bring that together. And also there's a, it, it's very, you, you compose things. It's how you, you generally as an F Sharp developer, you look to compose things. You don't try to say, here's a framework that tells you all the things to do. Um, you, you usually have pluggable compositions where you can bring in lots of different um, uh, great things. So between the composition and engagement, you get like a thriving community. And this is one of the things with Farmer. So Farmer was started by Isaac Abraham. He spoke earlier on SafeStack and he, and he built this, this uh, he initially started Farmer. But there's lots of Azure engineers that we use and we contribute to Farmer. And, and you know, it's a high quality project. It's well tested and documented. And they keep a low bar to contribution. Um, and, 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 and it's one of the scenarios where, you know, we can, we can use it, but we can also contribute greatly to it. There's a lot of resources. We have access to lots of infrastructure, so, so we can kind of heavily use it. And, and, and so, uh, anyway, it's, it's a, it's been a great experience to be able to participate in the OSS community with that. Um, are there any, uh, any particular questions so far? So I'm going to hop into a demo of this. Um, oops. 
right. So, so the demo. So, so uh, I want to use F sharp for infrastructure. Uh, as we know, F sharp is primarily for math and science. I'm going to do something mathy, like a chart uh, made from some math stuff. Um, but I'm going to make it into a service. And I'm going to define a Docker file for this service. So this is kind of the infrastructure sort of development. I'm also going to build a container registry, send the Docker file to the registry to build it, and deploy the image and container group. And um, you know, this is typical orchestration. And um, this is one of the things that you can do um, in Farmer, and and it'll help us manage the scale and complexity by by taking F# -sharp to define this orchestration as it changes and it gets bigger. And we have to have some logic into how, what pieces of the infrastructure we deploy, what libraries go with our application, what services go with our application, then we can, it'll help us keep that complexity under control. Um, and so let me switch over. All right. And, all right. So let's take, I'm going to take a quick look at it like a farmer. So, so if I take a, uh, Farmer script here. Um, and this is just a regular FSX file, nothing special. Um, thanks to the, the folks in the, the F Sharp team that built the uh, the scripting implementation. But you can just create an ARM template with use NuGet Farmer, open you know Farmer and Farm dot Builders, and then you start to define your template. And I'll show you what we get here. So um, .NET FSI Quick Start FSX. Um, it's going to take just a second to run. It's got a download package and all that stuff. Um, we should get our little quick start. So that gives you like nothing big, an empty template. Um, but say we wanted to add some resources to it. So add uh, resources, and we might want to add a storage account, and we'll call it name Dave's um, file storage one three. Yeah, kind of got to make it unique. Um, and now let's let's do that again. So run it again, and we get our nice little, it gives us a, a template that will have, you know, has all the kind of pieces built in. So as West US, it's storage v2, look where you've done the storage, and you have options for configuring all these things. You know, you can choose your SKU, and I'll be SKU, oops, uh, storage.skew. Uh, premium. You know, you can choose your SKU and kind of do that sort of stuff, but it takes some sane defaults, so you get, get up and going really quickly. And then you know, you can you can just deploy this sort of thing to Azure. So let me uh, switch over. I'll get a uh, go custom template. You can deploy right from the command line. Um, I'm just going to kind of show you as well how you can do it in the portal. Is you can just take that the thing that was generated by Farmer, and it's you know it, it recognizes it all. It's, it's valid syntax and all that stuff. Um, we'll call it um, Dave's Farmer Demo. Um, we'll call it that. We'll, what are we doing? West US. I'm assuming this. Do that real quick. Um, all right. So we'll create it. I'm going to let it churn. It doesn't take too long to deploy a storage account, but it's really good at building a, a, a pretty simple deployment. So I'm going to um, I'm going to go over building a little bit more of a complex application. So like I'll, while that one's churning in Azure, uh, it's not done yet. Um, so I did a, did a little thing is let's say our .NET, uh, it's just taken straight from the Plotly website um, or the Xplot website where, you know, we can just generate a little chart and I'm gonna, you know, draw a surface chart. And it, it, it looks like uh, FSI, uh, xplot-server.fsx, um, so we'll, build and run a, a little server that um, would run locally. And I'm going to put it on Azure. So um, there we go. So our listener's going. That thing's still deploying. All right, so let me uh, localhost. So here's our, you know, there's not much to it, um, but it you know, generates a nice little chart, looks like math. Um, OK, and then uh, we'll go back to our script. So. If I want to take that and deploy it to Azure, so we got a few things. So I'm going to, I, I have that little Xplot server, and I'm just going to read all the source into it. In real life, you'll have like a, uh, you know, you'll have a whole system with, you know, that can run CI. You'll have source control and all that stuff. But here, I, I'm just, a, I don't have that. I'm just going to read it into, into my script. I'm going to put that into a Docker file, um, all kind of from F Sharp. So I'll take the source. 
I'll embed the source into a Docker file. Um, since I've got the the whole .NET ecosystem, you know, it's just regular .NET code. I can convert it to Base64, and then I can encode it in my embed it in my Docker file, and not worry about escaping. This is kind of an infrastructure developer trick. <laughs> you end up you can do things like that. Um, Base64 is your friend. Um, and we're gonna build, I'm gonna build a Docker file. I'm gonna contain, create a container registry, um, and that, that's this little bit of code. And then I'll create a, a deployment identity. It's got to run a user identity that can then build my image. So it's going to connect to that container registry and it'll send it that Docker file um, up to the container registry to build it. We'll let that churn. And then once it's done, we'll deploy it to container group. And one of the neat things about this is, so I, I, I build the image and I get a step you know, called build, build image deployment script. That's my, so, I can create this container group like I was showing before, but it depends on the build image deployment script being complete. So ARM will orchestrate it for me and get these all done in the right order. So let me, um, let me shut down my local one. Let's see, .NET, FSI, Xplot, Xplot-Azure. And um, let's see if we got, let me get done with our storage account. Yeah, our storage account. Um, yeah, Dave's farmer demo. So that, that all worked nicely. Um, let's go. We're going to create another resource here. Again, a custom template and create. Now, let's see what we got here. So, it generated this big, much bigger template. So, it's, it's, and I could walk through the complexity on here, but it, you know, all these things have their um dependencies built in. So, this thing depends on the um, what resource is this? The Deployment script depends on the container registry being created and user identity needs to be created. And then my um, my uh, container group also depends on the deployment script finishing. So you have all this orchestration that's all kind of just in here, um, but I'm not having to think about it, which is kind of nice. Um, and so when I change and I forget to think about it, then in the, you know, F Sharp's kind of thinking about it for me. So I've got all these resources I want to deploy let me save it. Let me create a new uh, xplot-azure. Uh, we're going to deploy that service. Um, again, we'll go on west, US, and then and then it'll hopefully be valid. Yeah, great. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll let it create it. Um, so this takes just a couple more minutes. So I do want to take a little bit of time to, to see if anybody's got any questions or anything while this one's going, because it's going to actually build the container, it's gonna deploy all the container registry. It's going to uh, actually build the um, Docker image, push it to the registry, and then deploy that to container. We can kind of see the steps going here. Um, but any uh, any questions from, from anyone so far? Hey, Dave, can you hear me okay? Yes, hey, Jim. Okay, great, <laughs> technical, technical details resolved for the time being. Um, no questions at the time, um, but if you are following along, please feel free to ask your questions on Twitter, which is the hashtag .netconf, and we'll get those answered right away. Um, but you're doing great, <laughs> and I'm sure the questions will come in, and we'll save a few minutes at the end to, to get to those, okay? All right, great. Thank right, you. Cool. Um, yes, so there's a, there's a bunch of things that are going on here. You see this, it's like doing operations on the container registry. So it, it deploys the container registry and then it also has to retrieve credentials from the container registry to actually use them in the deployment. So, I mean, I can, I can kind of walk through what all of this looks like, um, but it's almost like inhuman. It's, it's um, if you were just man manually creating these in JSON or, or even in Bicep, you probably wouldn't easily be able to do stuff like encode all of your, your encode some file that I, that I want to put into my script. Um, you know, embedding a resource. Uh, it's this long string of base 64, and then I, I write it out to a Docker file, some kind of like shipping code inside an ARM template. Um, so it, it'll, it allows you to be able to use your the .NET framework. Um, full framework is available when you're building these templates. Um, you've got you know the the all the the whole open source ecosystem, and you got any new good package that you want, you can pull in, and so. I mean, one of the ones that I pulled in here was to actually build the Docker file. So pulled in fsharp.txt.docker, which you know kind of builds the Docker file and, and lots of little fsharp um, into elements. Um, I don't think it's as pretty as Farmer, but it does the trick and, and, if, and it lets me know if I've kind of messed something up. So I always get a valid Docker file. Um, 
And then we are able to encode that Docker file as base64, stick it into a script. Um, and, and when we're building our, you know, when we're de de uh, generating our deployment script, um, we're able to use things like interpolated strings from F sharp. Um, so I'll, I'm able to take my encoded Docker file and stick it in here. Um, and then, and then it'll be inserted. So it's, it's fairly clear code here. It's, you know, not so clear when you look at it from the arm template side, but, but this ultimately becomes more maintainable. And you can see your dependencies. I mean, if I messed up my um, Docker file and it, it wasn't building, then I wouldn't be able to get an encoded Docker file. I wouldn't be able to put it into my ARM template and I wouldn't be able to generate the template. So it, it enforces um, uh, putting together healthy code and healthy deployments. Um, let's see where we are on that one. Oh, it's still going. So this usually takes a few minutes, but hopefully we'll get it done in time. Okay, good. So it built the image and then we're getting to the Xplot Azure side, which is usually the quickest. So let me go to that. Um, what did I call? Let's just go here. So Xplot Azure. Hey, so, David, it looks like we do have a couple questions. Okay. So if you want to get to them, I'm happy to ask them. Yes, definitely. Okay, great. Uh, so Ben from Twitter asks, um, Farmer is Farmer officially supported the same way that Terraform and ARM templates or BICEP are? Um, so there is su support. So Farmer is a uh, open source community project. Um, so it's not like Microsoft supports it. So I'm not. You know, I, I don't. I'm not endorsing that I would support all the uh, everything um, for it. But it, it, it there is support available. Um, from Compositional IT, um, they sell support packages for it. So it's kind of the open source and you can buy support for it, which is often a requirement if you want to use it in a corporate or government environment or anything like that. You can, often these companies will say, hey, do you have a support package for all the open source that you use? And you, you can get one and, and you know, they're active about doing fixes as well. So, Okay, great. Good to know. And then we do have one other question. Um, uh, what is your background and how do you get up to speed with Farmer, your developer background? Gotcha. Yeah, my developer background. So um, I've kind of been in, in infrastructure for a, a long time. Um, so I, I did a lot of VMware type of work and I still do VM, uh, Azure VMware Solutions is the group that I'm in. Um, and I, I've worked in, if you do infrastructure development, you'll probably do a lot of things in Python. You'll probably do some things in lots of different languages as Go. Um, but I, so I, I end up having to work in a few different languages. Um, and, but, you know, that that's just kind of what comes with the course. But um, yeah, I, I primarily, I, I got started into infrastructure development because I uh, came from more of a uh, bit of a support background where I was doing kind of development support work. And then that kind of grew into infrastructure development. And uh, and then that, that's kind of when we came to Azure, we were doing the Azure VMware solutions. And, and uh, yeah, so that's my background. Um, what was the other question about the? Oh, and then the other question is, how do they get up to speed with Farmer? Uh, how do you get up to speed? So Farmer does have pretty rich documentation. Um, if you go to Compositional IT, uh, Compositional IT Farmer. If you go to, um, on the Farmer repository, and that's one of the things about it, is this, there's a, there's a ton of docs, um, and there's a ton of samples um, of the different kind of scenarios. That, uh, let's go. Let's actually look at the scripts um, and all sorts of different resources from Azure: Cosmos, deployment scripts, functions, event hubs, um, Databricks, all these sorts of things. And a lot of these are just you know the, they're created by the community. And there's also some ways that you can make stuff, if it's not in Farmer yet, you, you, there are ways around that, that you can automatically, you know, you can add those resources just ad hoc as you need them. It's got a rich website, um, lots of quick starts to kind of get you going. Um, and, and you know, I, I recommend walking through some of these and it's gotten, a, it's just gotten simpler since .NET 5 came out because you've got the, the F Sharp scripts. So does that look? Amazing. Um, well, we're right at time here. Were we able to get that built? Yes, and that yeah, the build did finish with my container instance. Um, so yeah, it took you know maybe five minutes. But instead of our localhost one, let's go to the one on the on the Azure Container Instances Farmer Chart. So it's yeah, it's up and running there. Um, our little container group here, 
and uh, all the different resources that we deployed. So the the container registry, when they went the script to build the image and push it to the container registry, and finally container instance to actually deploy it to something. Um, and all that took I don't know what it take three three almost four minutes. Um, so and that was all. I didn't have to run anything locally. It was all done um, within ARM. Credentials are pulled out of the credential registry and used to deploy the containers, but I never touch them. It's all kind of inside ARM. Um, so it helps with security and, and things like that as well. So, all right. Amazing. Well, thank you for that excellent demo, uh, Dave. That was really awesome. Um, we appreciate the insight. Uh, and yeah, let's. We're going to go ahead and and move on. Those were all the questions. If you have questions, please feel free to reach out, to Dave, on Twitter. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much.